So my wife literally just whispered to me, I like going first. (laughs) Um, You gave me the first part today. (laughs) Awkward. (laughs) And your mic's on. (laughs) Hey. We are in part three of the Love Where You Live series, but before we get into the teaching, we want to recognize a milestone today, and it is with so much gratitude to God and to all of you that I get to say to you today, happy eighth birthday, Epic Church. Yeah. And for those of you that are kind of like Johnny come lately, he's like, of course, why wouldn't we? Listen, when we showed up with 13 people and began to meet in our apartment, it was months before number 14 came along, okay? So we do never assume that birthdays are just inevitable. And I also want us to keep this in mind. This is true. If you think about businesses, companies, churches, unfortunately, and we know way too many individuals for whom a great past did not guarantee an amazing future, right? Right? I never want to be, as someone told me in year one out here, they said, Ben, make sure, you know, in the early days, it's going to feel like a movement. Make sure that this stays a movement and it never becomes a monument, right? It never becomes a monument. I never want to take for granted that because we had eight amazing years that year nine is guaranteed. And yet, I've told several of you lately that I'm in my favorite season of being a part of this thing than I've ever been in before. Um, I wouldn't say that if it weren't true. I'd probably say nothing if it weren't true. Um, But it is true. We are loving the season of life. You've got cupcakes today. That's kind of what we do here for birthdays. Um, It's fun. A couple of weeks ago, we went ahead and set the date for our tenure, which is going to be, I know you've got your calendars for 2021. Um, It's just super easy to remember, 2-21-2021. See? See how we did that? You're like, is that a Tuesday? No, it's a Sunday, silly. It's going to be great. February 21st, 2021. Also, we're giving copies of Shauna's book away, and that really captures a lot of these first eight years. Um, If I ever write a book, I don't know what it will be about since she took those stories, but um, it really captures those those eight first years and, and so much about our personal lives and so many stories of people here at Epic Church. You may not know this, but there were primarily two reasons why we chose the name Epic when we decided what to call this downtown church in San Francisco. The first reason we chose Epic is kind of the standard thing that we're aware of, at least today, that something that is beyond the status quo, something that's of epic proportion. It wasn't about us being awesome, but it was about the realization that God has gone all in for us, that he's given us his very best, and in response to that, we want to bring our very best. We never want to settle. We never want to be okay with the status quo, and I don't mean awesome in the world's eyes. I just mean we want to be faithful and give our very best to the God who's given his very best to us and for us. The second meaning for epic, though, is is what I'm going to launch into today. It's really this idea of a grand tale, a a story, this grand narrative. And one of my personal passions, which has become a passion for our church, is I love to talk to people about God writing this grand story in history and that each one of you, each one of us, has a significant part to play in that story. So if you hang with us long enough, you go look at our media page. Sometimes people are like, really purpose again, Ben? I think there's nothing greater than realizing God has a purpose and we have a purpose because God has a purpose and then aligning ourselves from our purpose to his purpose. I think there's nothing better to do with our lives. So we're constantly inviting you in. Jump into what God has for you. You get to play a part. But not only do we have a story to live in, we have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. And I know we kind of feel all over the map when it comes to how good we are at storytelling. How many of you always like botch the, 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 uh, the punchline in a joke? Anybody? Like you're just like, and then you, and everybody, like, we're, we're like, tell us more. And you're like, I forgot. <laughs> That's terrible. Here's what you need to know when it comes to your story. Now, not all of us have the same gift of storytelling, but all of us have a story to tell. Not all of us have the same gift of storytelling, but all of us have a story to tell. And you don't have to be a great storyteller to have a great story to tell. And the best storytellers in all of the world cannot tell your story like you can tell your story. That's what we're after today. Stories are powerful. 
I love getting facts. Facts are our friends, as one of our mentors says. Uh, I'm a numbers guy, so I geek out a little bit on spreadsheets. I don't create the spreadsheets. Just when somebody else creates them, I kind of geek out on that information. I love to look at trends and how this happens. I love all of that. But information and even Excel spreadsheets, as we all know, these things rarely have the ability to move us the way stories move us, right? Can you imagine going to the theater and just seeing two hours of Excel spreadsheets? And you paid $13.50 for it. Like, that would be the worst. We want to be moved and stories move us. This actually is nothing to do with my Christian faith, but I believe that Jesus perhaps is the greatest storyteller in history. If you just look at how he shared information, he didn't typically choose to give a theology lecture. He typically chose to tell stories. I'll give you a few just the condensed version. When he wanted us to know what God's heart was like towards us, he tells a story, right? To convey that truth of God's love for us, he tells a story about a wayward son who's fully welcomed back with arms open wide, embraced by his father, even though that wayward son used all of his father's resources to waste them in reckless living. When Jesus wanted us to know how valuable the kingdom of God is, he told a story, He said that there was this guy and he found treasure and the treasure was so valuable to him that he went back and sold everything he had so that he could buy that treasure. He wanted us to know that's how valuable we should see the kingdom of God because it is. When he wanted us to consider what we're building our lives on, he told a story about two individuals. They both constructed houses. Externally, both homes looked exactly the same. But when the storms came, one home stayed standing. The other one was destroyed. And he said, this guy built his house on the rock while this one over here built his house on the sand. Consider what you're building your life on. When Jesus wanted to convey deep spiritual truths, he told stories. But I believe Jesus didn't just tell stories. He invited us into his story. Stories grip us. Stories move us. Stories have the ability to transform us. Speaking of stories, I really want to ask you this. Are you living into and out of the story God has for you? Are you living into, and what I mean by that is this, that God has this big story. If you think about kind of the movie thing that we're, so many of you are into, you, you think about like God's the director of this big grand story. He hands you the script. You see the part that's highlighted with your name on it. First you complain that you didn't get the other part and God's like, settle down. And then he's just asking you, are you content and will you live into and then out of the story that I have for you? Why are we so fixated on everyone else's stories? There is no story you will enjoy more than the one that was created for you specifically. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, so often we buy into this world strategy that, oh, if you have the most followers on social media, you're more important. Or, oh, if you have a position higher up the chain, you're more important. The worst thing you can do is to live into what the script the world wants to give to you. The best thing you can do, no matter what it looks like to the world, is live into and then live out of what God has for you. We all know that every good story has a very clear setting. And if San Francisco or the Bay Area is your setting or wherever you may be watching from today, that setting is the setting for this chapter in your story. Now, some of you might want to skip that chapter. Some of you may want to just rush through that chapter. But God wants you to know that he's not giving you a story that you can pick up once this chapter is over. He wants you to pick up his story and where your story intersects his story right now while you're still here. You're like, Ben, I've only got six months left. You, you, you may have your heart change and have another six years. Everybody's frowning. Stop. God wants to do that. And I also have to ask you this. Are you telling the story God is writing in your life? Are you telling the story God is writing in your life? If not, let me tell you why that may be the case. Here's what we're prone to believe. My story isn't that significant, so why tell it? Or my story has dark places and shady characters in it, so I'm too ashamed to tell it. Or Ben, and I love this about so many of you, as we launched the Alpha Group Tuesday night, 61 people showed up for Alpha Tuesday. It was amazing. So many of you are in this category. Ben, my story with Jesus is just beginning, so I should probably wait and tell it once I know how it's going to go. There's a woman we encounter in John chapter 4 who had all of those excuses she could have used to not tell her story. Her story really wasn't significant, not in terms of that day and time at the the moment. Uh, Her story was filled with dark characters and some uh, dark places and some shady characters. This woman had been married five times. She's now living with a man who isn't her husband. Not a big town. I'm thinking I would have moved to a different town. And Shauna learned where I live, learned to love where I live there, not so much here. And she stays there and she barely knows anything about Jesus. And yet she shares her story. 
And because she shares her story, a lot of other people see Jesus enter their story. So I want you to stand with me. I'm going to read just four verses, John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. It'll be on the screen. And then I'm going to read verse 39 as well. And what I'm here to tell you, and what we try to do at Epic all the time is, guys, sometimes we make Christianity and sharing our story so complicated, right? We, we make it so complex. I want you just to see what she did, and I think we can all do what she did. Verse 28. Then, after she had encountered Jesus, everything's going down, disciples come back, leaving her water jar, the one thing she came to the well at noon to get, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him, toward Jesus. Verse 39, conclusion time. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. You may be seated. Just a few comments before Shauna comes to do her part that's second, not first. She has a shady past. She barely knows Jesus. Do you hear her question? Could he be the Messiah? She doesn't even know for sure that he is. And we're like, no, Ben, I've got to be for sure. I've got to have two years in the church. Da, 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 da. Nope, she just told what she experienced. Don't make this so complicated. If Jesus has entered your story and done anything, just tell your story because she shared her testimony. Verse 39 says, her story. Many in the town that, I, that she tried to avoid. She's at the well by, at noon that day because she didn't want to see anybody from town. She moves because of her story with Jesus, one encounter. She moves from not wanting to see a soul in that town to wanting to go share with every soul in that town. I wonder if what happened with her story on that day in her town could happen in your story on this day in our city. Because what makes a story most believable is when you hear it directly from the person who experienced it. That was, that was the Samaritan woman's story. She doesn't tell someone else's story. She's telling her story. It's not always easier. You have to look at this woman and think the courage that she had that day to tell her story. But it's always more credible to tell your own story than someone else's. But we've all been there. We might even be there right now on our devices. I hope not. But we've all been there where we know so much about his life or her life, and we feel like we're their BFFs even though we've never met them, but we know them really well on these devices we carry around, right? Or we go to work tomorrow, and we are telling our colleagues all about this amazing, incredible weekend in Aspen. Only we didn't go to Aspen. It was our friends who went to Aspen, and we're telling them their story. Do we think that their stories are just that more fun? Do we think our lives are that boring? Okay, I want us to look this morning through this lens for our story. Are you an onlooker or are you a witness? Are you an onlooker or are you a witness? I want to give us some substance to these words. A witness is someone who sticks around to tell what happened. A witness is present. They're involved. Witnesses talk to others and the story doesn't get old. Onlookers aren't engaged, but witnesses are. Onlookers pass by. It's not their issue. It's not their problem. Onlookers avoid risk and find it safer to keep their distance. We are living here either as an onlooker or a witness. I want to show you another example in the New Testament. The resurrection has happened, and we're going to pick up in John 20, even though the people in this story are just about to find out. John 20, verses 15 through 18. It will be on the screen. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he, thinking Jesus was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. 
and she told them that he had said these things to her. It's interesting, in, in Mary's story and, and in the Samaritan woman's story, there was no delay, just to Ben's point. It's not like they went and got seminary training to tell their story. They went immediately, and they just told them simply what they were experiencing. For Mary, prior to this moment, it was her and Peter and John who first went to the tomb to discover that Jesus' body was no longer there. The guys go back home, and Mary stays. Now, the scripture doesn't explain why Mary stayed and they went back home, but I just think that her girlfriends were all still in bed. They were not morning people. Or I also might think, like me, she just needed to be in the moment to process all that she was just experiencing. But here are some more thoughts. When we witness something that's incredible, we stay around a little longer. We explore a little more. We let our, heart break, let our hearts break and we encounter Jesus. We stay around a little longer, we explore a little more, we let our hearts break, and we encounter Jesus. Mary stuck around. She went to the tomb early. She sees that the stone has been rolled away. She goes back to tell the guys. She brings some of them to the tomb and shows them. They leave, she goes on to discover an angel. Then she engages in this conversation with the gardener, or so she thinks. And she tells him what matters most to her. She's not even realizing she's talking to Jesus, but even in talking to Jesus, she tells him Jesus is who matters most. Mary then goes on and announces to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Thought he was a gardener, but he's not. And that's beside the point now, right? I have seen the Lord. This should be our aim. This should be our aim, to see the Lord, to see where he's working, to see what he's doing, to see what God is doing right here around us. That's what makes us a witness. I can pick up the phone and call my sister in Georgia or my sister in Kentucky, and they can tell me about what they're experiencing and what they're learning and how they're growing and what God's doing around them. And I can Marco Polo. Does anyone else Marco Polo? Okay, it's a thing. I can Marco Polo, my friend in Connecticut, and talk to her about what God is doing in her life, but that makes me an onlooker. Does that make sense? That makes me an onlooker into their lives. What makes me a witness is when I tell you what I'm seeing God do, when I tell you the things that God is stirring in my heart, when I tell you just, hey, I'm a mom, and, and I'm raising four kids, and I'm getting kids all around the city, and, and I sit down and have a conversation with my neighbor who lives next door that's, that's experiencing cancer, and, and I tell her about how we've walked this journey with, with our moms. It's just telling her. It's sharing our stories of what we've seen God do and the hope that we have in Him. In the book, Love Where You Live, Maybe you've cracked it open, maybe not, but you need to know it's got a lot of stories in there, many from the people who make up Epic Church. And those stories are eyewitness accounts because these people have seen. They've stayed around a little longer. They've explored a little more. They've let their hearts break and they've encountered Jesus. Let's not be satisfied living vicariously through someone else's stories. We are witnesses here. We share what we see. We speak of what we see God doing. This is hard. This requires we get involved. It requires that we get up and off the sidelines. It doesn't come natural. What comes natural is fear. So Mary has announced to the disciples, I, I've seen the Lord. And you would think this kind of announcement, like you've seen people do, like I'm trying to do right now, where someone stands up and says, don't be afraid anymore. The only thing is with this announcement to the disciples, they're still full of fear. If you pick up the text in verse 19 through 21, where Shauna left off, it says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So when Jesus steps into this room, he steps right in the middle of their fears. They've heard the pronouncement, he's alive, and yet they're still afraid. The scriptures tell us that you and I have the resurrection power of Jesus living in us, and yet so many of us are still what? 
very afraid. Jesus steps into their fear and he pronounces the antidote to their fear. He doesn't tell them to go live an easy, comfortable life, does he? You see, we become so convinced that our fear reality or our peace reality is directly tied to the circumstances in our life. And so you know this. We do this, people all around your office, at your happy hours, in your small groups, at this church. We do this. We look at what we need to have in life so we're no longer afraid. We pursue those things. We get them. And guess what? We still are. Uh, afraid. We're still afraid. The answer wasn't for these disciples to go pursue an easy life. The answer was they could pursue whatever they needed to because they don't have to be afraid any longer. This has been unearthing something in my life that has been so massive to me. And I want to share what's happened in my life just a little bit with these two ideas and how it could free you up in your life. Like you, so much of my life was about looking at what I needed to have circumstantially so that I could have the peace and joy that I wanted. And making sure that I avoided certain things circumstantially so that I could get rid of my anxiety and get rid of my fear. But do you know what I found? And you know this to be true too if you think about it. If fear dominates your life, then you're afraid even when you have nothing to be afraid of. You know this, right? You lie, you lie awake at night till you find something you can be afraid of. And then you're awake the rest of the night. But if the peace of Jesus begins to dominate our lives, then we will have peace and no fear even when we should have fear. This past week, I won't tell you all of the details, at least not yet, but I was in a couple of occasions where the old me and probably the current you would have freaked out, right? I'd have been like, what church is that in Dallas that wants a teaching pastor? Um, you just would have freaked out, right? And I didn't. And I didn't not because, oh, I'm strong. I didn't not because it was easy. It was not. I should have been afraid by all sort of situations that we would think about having fear. And I wasn't afraid at all because the grace, joy, satisfaction, peace of Jesus was residing inside of me. And here's what's amazing. I don't get that peace and no fear because I'm the pastor. I get it because I'm finally embracing and receiving what Jesus wants to give to every single person in this room. You tell me how come you still keep getting X, Y, and Z and your fears keep escalating along with your anxiety. Guys, there's never been more accomplishment or achievement in our world. There's never been more pleasure in our world and yet people still are empty. Anxiety is up and to the right and yet everything that seems like it would need to be present to remove all of our fear and anxiety, that stuff is there and yet the fear is still present too. You've been offered an alternative way. This moment in this room with the disciples, when Jesus enters it, they are afraid. And they've been afraid. Do you know that all of the disciples deserted Jesus because they were afraid? Not because they didn't love him. They were afraid. They denied Jesus. They were cowards. They didn't want anything to do with the official leaders. They didn't want to be put in the wrong situation. They didn't want to be persecuted. But from this moment on, they're no longer afraid. And you're like, Ben, did it get easier to be a Christian? It got harder. But they're no longer afraid, not of political leaders, not of religious leaders, not of imprisonment, not of death itself. In fact, most of them are going to give their lives for Jesus through martyrdom. How did this happen and why is it so important? I venture to say that not only was this moment crucial for the first century, I think it's the crucial moment to the whole of Christianity. Like, Ben, why? Here's why. Jesus had this crazy strategy that he still employs. What was it? Jesus' strategy wasn't to stay alive forever and do all his own bidding. His strategy was to have those first disciples go and tell their story. And his strategy for 21st century disciples is the same. Go and tell your story. Go tell your story. But he promised that as we go and tell our story, he would be with us. When he gave the great commission in Matthew 28, he said, and lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of this age. I'm with you as you go. This week, our staff looked at Jesus' promise in John 14, 12. You will do even more than I would do. And I'm like, Jesus, come on, man. That's humility at its finest. But really, how could he say that? He said, because I'm going to the Father. What did he mean? He, mean, he meant when I go to the Father, I'm sending my spirit to be with you. So you have to know this. The author of our story is very present when we tell our story. You're not on your own when you tell your story. The scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit will give you the words as you tell your story. All he wants from you is faith and obedience. He will give you the words to speak. And besides, don't act confused about, I don't know what my story is. You know your story. You know you were lost and now you're found. You know that peace used to elude you and now you've found it. 
you, you know that you were hopeless and in despair and Jesus gave you hope. You know what your story is. You know exactly what your story is. And guys, we should absolutely assume that what Jesus said to those first century disciples in that room that day, he's saying to us in this room on this day, as the Father has sent me to tell my story, so I'm sending you and you and you and you and you and you to tell your story. I'm still waking up to this reality that story matters. I mean, clammy hands. Anyone else get clammy hands when you go to tell your story? Yes. I'm still waking up to this reality that story matters and how God uses our stories to connect with one another. But what is blowing my mind lately is how our stories intersect with other people. When we engage as storytellers here on earth, I believe that God brings heaven to earth, opening things up, moving things around. This is what makes you smile when you are paying attention and you think the only way this happened is because of God. I'll give you an example of one way that we see this play out. How many of you are here at Epic because someone at Epic invited you? Okay, there's a, no a number of hands. That's awesome. Well, years ago, it was us inviting Anna, who invites her family, who invites Jessica, who invites Lorica. It was Alan from Ireland who tells a colleague moving to San Francisco about the church. It was Linda inviting praise, inviting Claire. It was the Kiel family who invited the Tan family. And going back to where this all began, as we've been talking about, in the book of Acts, it was Philip with Simon, and then Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch that took the gospel to the whole country of Ethiopia. You see, it wasn't some uh, strategy meeting that took place between Jesus and Philip that got him to tell the take the gospel to Ethiopia. No, it was Philip who's walking along the road. He feels a nudge from the Spirit that says, go over to that chariot and stand near it. And when he does, he looks inside, and this Ethiopian official is reading scripture. And the Ethiopian says, explain to me what I'm reading. And it's because of storytelling that this Ethiopian becomes the first Christian in Ethiopia. Okay, further along in Acts 16, Paul gets a vision in the night to go to Macedonia. When he gets there, he takes a Sabbath rest down by the river. And as Paul goes down to the river, he sees a group of women in conversation. And Paul begins to talk to them. And the scripture says, the Lord opened up her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened up her heart. We tell the story and God does the rest. The Lord opened up her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. That woman was Lydia. And historians and commentators believe Lydia was the first Christian in all of Europe. Do you see it? Do you see this grand vision that God has had? Nations are comprised of cities and towns and villages. Cities, towns, and villages are comprised of people. How do we impact the city and the town and the village? We reach the individual. How do we reach the individual? We tell our story. We tell what we've seen. We tell of what we've experienced. And that will inspire others to tell theirs. Our stories lead to more stories. Our witness can cause more witnesses. If you look back at the story I told of the resurrection, what happens to Mary and Thomas and the disciples after the resurrection? Well, everything has changed, yet nothing has changed. Everything being Jesus has been crucified, resurrected, and ascended to his Father in heaven. Everything has changed, yet nothing has changed. They stayed in their same town and returned to their same jobs. But John 20, 29, this is what Jesus said. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. So how are we able to believe in 2019? Well, it goes back to that moment where Mary and the disciples encountered Jesus and told their story to people who encountered Jesus and told their story to people who encountered Jesus and told their story to people who encountered Jesus and told their story. That's how we are able to believe today. I encourage you to go back this week and read John 20 and John 21 and Acts 1. They connect. And this is the setting where this grand vision of God begins to take off. Luke writes in the book of Acts how Jesus spent his last 40 days post-resurrection. And listen to what he says before he returned to heaven. 
This will be on the screen. Acts 1, 7, and 8. Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's not for us. He says it's not for us to know the times and seasons. It's not for us to know how long we will live here, how well the company will do, how long our kids will live with us, but it is for us to know that we will receive the power from the Holy Spirit. And because God is good, and because he knows what we need, we lay down these questions about times and seasons, and we pick up his power to tell our story. Witnesses get a better picture anyway than those who stay fixated on times and seasons. Witnesses are a part of the grand vision. Onlookers are the ones consumed with times and seasons. Ben challenged us last week to consider how we will live here rather than how long we will live here. And then look at the last part of what Jesus says in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses right where you are and wherever you go. Let's be so caught up with what God is showing us, with what he is teaching us, with what he's doing around us, that we're not gonna be fixated on times or seasons because there's so much going on that he wants to show us that that is what we're speaking of. So when you travel for work this week, as half of you will probably do, tell your story. When you're at the dinner table, or you're in the classroom, or you're at the park, or you're in an appointment, tell your story. When you're in meetings with colleagues and in meetings with clients, tell your story. And when you find yourself in a conversation you weren't even expecting to be in this week, ask them about their story and then tell your story. We all, collectively and individually, we all have a story worth telling. As we move now into a time of response and we're going to have communion and, and worship, I'm gonna ask that you close your eyes for a minute I'm gonna pray for us, but before I do, I wanna ask you, is Jesus a part of your story? The most significant part of our story is when we encounter him. And communion is this beautiful time to remember what he has done for us on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. After, we, after I pray and we experience communion, there are going to be two stations down here to the left and right of the stage and one station towards the back. But maybe for you, you're wondering, how do I become a Christian? If that's you, I want you to look this way. You become a Christian by faith. You believe by faith that Jesus is the Son of God who died for the forgiveness of your sins and was resurrected and lives again. You receive that forgiveness and you follow him, turning away from your own ways and any other gods. With this confession of belief, you become his witness and you have a story worth telling. Jesus, this morning, we believe in you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your love. It is because of you that we have a story worth telling. Jesus, give us the courage this week to go and share our story. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and respond.